Julian, shall I go ahead or just give it a minute or two more? Uh, it's up to you, but... Um... Well, I think I'm going to start. Um, it's just after 11. So a very warm welcome to you all um, to the Center for HIV and SDIs um, and the NICD and HLS's World AIDS Day commemoration. And I hope that you will find the, the program um, of interest. So I know we've been markedly affected by the outbreak of COVID-19. It's had, it's had um, amazing effects on us in different ways very profound effects but i think we still need to remember hiv it's still here it's still with us it's had covid obviously 19 has had a profound effect in terms of how it's affected hiv and how we're managing it people accessing care and treatment the testing so there's been a whole range which COVID has affected us but it's still profound hiv is still a profound disease within our country and in our communities and the focus is really around centered on the communities, centered on the individual. That's the main theme that UNAIDS has, has, has come up with. Of course, it's also come up with a new set of um, ambitious targets. No longer is it just the 1990s, and there are now five 90s, the three of which are obviously the um, knowing your status, being on treatment and being virus suppressed. But then obviously a, a great deal of focus now on children. And as you know, in South Africa, that is still a, a major problem with regard to how we're managing HIV um, in children. And of course, integrated services, especially for women around um, sexual health and reproductive rights and reprodu reproductive health. That's still a very key and important um, aspect. And these 95 targets, as they are now called, 95, 95, 95, 95, 95, I hope you said that five times, um, has to be met by 2025 in order for us to eliminate um, HIV by 2030. So South Africa has made um, remarkable achievements with regard to treatment. So at least I think we're close to the first uh, 90 as it's now called, but maybe 95 is maybe just slightly more than we wanted. However, we still need to put a fair proportion of individuals um, on treatment. So there's been the various surges of surge campaigns to achieve that. And our incidence rates have certainly um, come down, but still young girls and young women are still more markedly affected than, than the others in our community, but that may also be changing. But again, if you look at the UNAIDS report that has just come out, there's still areas, even though there are these achievements, there's still much that, that needs to be done. In fact, I think if you look at the UNA's report, in fact, we all we fail on all aspects around this in terms of not reaching it. But I think there must be a renewed commitment, as I'm sure is expected. But we talk about COVID fatigue, but imagine about HIV. We've been going on for more than 30 years. So that, that is quite a, an interesting concept to use COVID fatigue when we're really been battling um, to really manage HIV over the last uh, few few decades. But I think that's why we've had um, the talks that we're going to have. It's not about the forgetting, it's also about the remembering and how we make that remembering a living memory as well. Um, and that's why we have um, invited Ahmed today to speak about the uh, Living Museum. And then I thought it was linked, in fact, that we then spoke about Herman and about educational materials and community and really how through visuals, we can actually look at our history around HIV and its management. And Herman has really been committed around working with communities and centering his work on communities. And that really fits in um, with our, our theme. So I hope you will find this um, hour or next 
55 minutes of, of great interest. And I think we just have a moment of reflection of those who um, have lost their lives that are near and dear to us. And, and of course, we can't imagine all the millions that have died, but just to remember them all. And of course, they're all those that are still markedly affected uh, by HIV and how it's affecting our communities. So for health and safety reasons, um, I decided to light the memorial candle and I hope you can see that in the background. It's been a constant um, for us since we've held the uh, Memorial Day or Commemoration Day. And so just a, a minute of silence and then we'll go on to, to Ahmed um, and start his um, concept around the um, museum. So a minute of silence and then we'll begin. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Adrian, for that introduction. Um, so this uh, is uh, the uh, 33rd uh, World AIDS Day. Um, uh, the first was actually in 1988. Uh, and at that point in time, South Africa had uh, around uh, 33,000 uh, HIV uh, infections. Obviously, over the past um, 33 years, uh, we've seen a lot uh, in South Africa with regards to HIV and AIDS. We've had well over 11 million HIV infections. There's been close to 4 million AIDS deaths. Uh, we've seen the national life expectancy uh, drop uh, by, uh, by 10 years between 1992 and 2004. But uh, We've also seen um, one of the most uh, successful social movements of all time. We've seen the largest rollout program of antiretroviral therapy in the world. And uh, we've seen uh, the rise in the national life expectancy by 10 years between 2004 and 2016. And with that in mind, I think uh, I have been thinking for some time that it's really about time that we uh, start to uh, document and more importantly archive uh, our South African narrative with regards to, to HIV and AIDS, not just as a, a testament of uh, what has passed, but also as a, a guide uh, to the future. So with that said, I'd like to introduce you to a concept which um, myself and a, and a few colleagues have been working on over the past uh, few months, and, and that is uh, to um, create uh, an online, uh, South Africa's online HIV and AIDS uh, museum. I'm hoping uh, you can see uh, the screen that I'm sharing. And the, the, the concept essentially is uh, for this to be uh, uh, an opportunity for South Africans to engage, uh, and, and also individuals globally, to engage with South Africa's narrative. Um, I'm hoping for this uh, to be an ongoing uh, live project uh, that will be uh, youth-centered, uh, immersive, uh, and an interactive experience uh, that uh, would uh, be not only educational, but, but also hopefully fun and, uh, and engaging. So I think I just wanted to share a few of the, um, let's say, the, the, the demo exhibits that we're working on. And, uh, a lot of the work that has gone into this is uh, by uh, um, a, a colleague uh, down in the, the Free State. So Mike Combrink, who is a data scientist at the University of Free State, has, has really been working very hard uh, to put this together. And I, I, I thank him um, from, from my heart, really. He's, he's put in so much effort. And uh, one of the exhibits that he's come up with is uh, to come up with a, a prevalence um, Clock. So if you look at the, the video that I'm going to play, the, the, the pink bar is South Africa's HIV prevalence, starting from 1985, and uh, this is using the uh, Tembisa model. So I'm just going to play that, and hopefully you can see 
over the years, what's been happening. So, um, and, and, and the big jump. So the green bar represents the new HIV infections per year. The blue is the uh, increase from the previous year and, and the below purple bar is the, uh, the age deaths per, per year. And uh, obviously uh, we have uh, come a long way since uh, 1988. And, uh, we are currently sitting with a situation whereby from 33,000 infections in 1988, we are dealing with, uh, see it just now, but uh, it's around uh, 7.8 million infections. And Although the prevalence keeps on rising, the bottom bar in terms of mortality is, it is reducing and has been reducing over the years. So the idea is for, for the data that we're sitting on to, to really make it accessible and interesting and engaging, especially for our young people. So what we have also at the bottom is a, a tour, um, which we will be working on. So this is a, a museum cart, which Mike has, has put together and uh, we're featuring various uh, uh, AIDS uh, and HIV uh, and AIDS posters over the years um, that you're able to click on. So this one is, is, is interesting. This is a, uh, a launch in 1998 by, by then Deputy President Tabu Mbeki. And at, at that point in time, we had a, a prevalence of 2.6 million, and yet still the, uh, the epidemic in South Africa was, was only really in its infancy at that point. And obviously, a lot has, has happened. Uh, since, since that year. I just also wish to thank uh, Dr. Leandra Holmes, who's a, a comm server and ICD, for doing an amazing job in, in, in collecting so much of the materials and posters over the years and uh, arranging them for us. Um, some of the posters you can see are provided below here, and uh, I'd really encourage you to, uh, to, to, to go on to the website. It's, if you go onto the browser, you simply type in hivmuseum.com and um, please uh, share with me or share with us uh, your ideas or, or any thoughts you have in terms of making this a, a success uh, for, for, for South Africa and, and, and the global community. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you very, very much for your time. And I'm going to stop sharing and uh, hand over back to Adrian, I think. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for um, introducing the idea and, and starting that off. I think it's really a fantastic and brilliant idea, and I, I think it really makes it living um, for all of us and, and I think for the general public as well. So we we'll look forward um, to those developments. But I'd like to now turn over um, to our guest speaker today. In fact, it was really as a result of Ahmed bringing up the idea of all the cartoons and the posters that, that we see very often over the last few years that we thought of inviting um, Dr. Herman um, Temba Reuter. And Herman has, was born in Windhoek in Namibia, and he's a medical doctor by training with a higher diploma in education and a postgraduate diploma in, in addiction care, and has had a, a wide range of, of experiences. He's worked in the public sector for seven years in Namibia and, and South Africa has been a provincial coordinator of treatment action campaign, and then with Doctor with Borders and Without Borders, that's for MSM for the last 10 years. And then he worked in Kailicha, Lusiki, Siki, and Swaziland, and as a character and real live person in the three letter play. And the lovely, some lovely quotes there, which I'm sure Herman will smile at and, and rage against. He's also been the HIV TB coordinator of, of John Hopkins University HIV program for two years in Ethiopia. And presently in the last few years, um, he's been coordinating Zahara, which is the Smoking Alcohol Harms Alleviation and Rehabilitation Association, and providing treatment for people with substance use of, um, disorders. He's also been advocating for medicine assisted therapy for substance use disorders as well and advocating for the Department of Health to provide smoking cessation medication, um, naltrexone and OST. So over to you, Herman, and we look forward to your, um, your views about where we've come from, where we are, and how you see the future. Thank you so much, Herman.
Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm just checking, can you all see me and can you hear me and can you see the slides? Yes, on yeah. both. Yeah. Yes, Helen. Okay, thank you. So the motto of COVID has basically been to flatten the curve. Um, and it was our present president, Ramaphosa, who had to deal kind of with the oversight of this flattening the curve. And on the left, you see a cartoon of our previous president's dealings with HIV epidemic, um, mainly acting too late or failing completely. So a lot of hope was on Ramaphosa. And you see the encouraging message from Mandela that if you've climbed one mountain, there's just another one after that. And he had to face it and he had to weigh up the consequences of crashing the economy against the benefit of a head-on intervention. Mbeki, on the other hand, was mainly philosophizing. And if you want to see what's on the TV screen, I'll just point it out to you. My computer doesn't move. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how old the audience is that I'm speaking to. And if the denialism of our president of the time and our health minister of the time is a living memory or if it's just something you hear in history. Um, but I'll try to talk us on how we as South Africa overcame some of the obstacles to get to the largest treatment program in the world. The name of this book, Moving Mountains, is basically attention to that, to the cartoon, but also a lot of my HIV work I did in Lusiki City in Hondoland of the Eastern Cape. And as I started, the book was published on Oliver Tambo. And in it, he talked about sitting in Pondoland and looking at Ngeli Mountain and wondering what was the other side of the mountain and how to get to the other side and if Johannesburg was on the other side and how would life be in Johannesburg. And he obviously then went to Johannesburg, studied law and became one of the early leaders of the African National Congress. But while I was building the program, the HIV director of the province, every time when she saw me, she told me, um, I was known as Tamba in the Eastern Cape. Tamba, the tourists, when they come to the Eastern Cape, they say it's so lovely, so many mountains and these grassy hills. But for us people living here, each hill is an obstacle on the way to Joburg. And in the same year, a book was published on Paul Farmer, who is one of the radical doctors in the USA that managed one of the early AIV programs in Haiti. And his biography was also called Mountains Beyond Mountains. So let's talk how we overcome those mountains of the HIV epidemic. For me, the history of it starts back in 1980 with the launch of an organization of the ANC that was still banned, a movement called the Marxist Workers' Tendency of the ANC. We were basically an organization within the ANC similar to the South African Communist Party, uh, yet smaller. And whereas the ANC of the Communist Party was basically kind of built on the ideas of Stalin's Comintern, the Third International. So the Marxist workers' tendency was built on the ideas of Trotsky and the Fourth International. And the leader in South Africa of this organization was Zaki Ahmad, who later became the leader of the Treatment Action Campaign. And this journal was 
produced by ANC Comrades in Exile. And one of the editors on this journal was Mark Haywood, who later also became one of the leaders of the treatment action campaign. In 1990, Zaki Ahmad tested HIV positive and basically withdrew a little bit from the Marxist workers' tendency. But what he did, he joined a film school. And I just want to show you a little clip of a film that he made as his response to testing positive for HIV. I just thought that that was amazing <clears throat> that 30 years later I could find this film on the internet. Um, Zaki had involved me in the film. I was a medical student at the time, and he just asked me to check for the medical correctness of the content of the movie. And I think I found it as part of the Beated Sia Yankoba documents on YouTube. And I think that one should definitely look at including these films that are a valuable history of South African HIV activism, and somehow include them in the, in the museum. At the time of 1993, um, basically there was a progressive healthcare work organization, the National Public Primary Healthcare Workers, and we, I wasn't involved in this conference, um, but that kind of was the progressive movement that led to progressive medical thinking in Kusatu, and also later influenced the policies of the HIV government that came into power in 1994. Most of the information was about stigma, about knowing more about HIV, and about safer sex practices. I particularly like the naughtiness of this don't get caught. Obviously, mum walking into the room. Uh, but the big issue was, do you use a condom or not? What was completely new with the HIV epidemic is the way that people living with HIV took control and started challenging us as healthcare workers as to whether we were doing enough. And I think it comes partly from the anti-apartheid movement and partly from the gay um, health movement. This poster you saw just now, um, the government committing to a partnership involving civil society, service users, and it all seemed well, but it lacked kind of vision it was centered around red ribbons, kind of some symbolism of hope, but didn't 
really look at how to increase primary healthcare facilities to be able to actually treat people with HIV. The slogan of the day, which I also found quite misguided, was ABC, abstain, be faithful, condomize. And it had no resonance with youth as to actually preventing unsafer sex. And it put many couples at risk where married couples thought they were safe because they were faithful and yet they got HIV. I think this slogan led to many, many HIV infections in this country. Then at the end of 1998, something changed. The treatment action campaign was born. And with it, the HIV positive t-shirt. And just quickly to reflect on the first HIV positive t-shirt that was made was for the funeral of Ugud Lamini. Ugud Lamini was an activist in Durban or a person living with HIV. I'm not sure how much of an activist she was, but she was open about her HIV status and she spoke on a radio station in KZN on the 1st of December, exactly 22 years ago. Later that week, neighbors hit her over the head and she succumbed to the injuries. When Tech heard about this, we decided to make a t-shirt to support her at the funeral. And it was based on the idea that the Danish king promulgated in Denmark during the Nazi occupation, where the Nazis, the Germans forced all Jewish people to wear a star of David, basically an armband around the arm with a star on it, signifying that they were Jewish population, which made them extremely vulnerable and open to attack by anybody. And in that way, we said, if we put an HIV positive on the t-shirt, that that would signify you cannot kill us all. So rather, don't try and find the people living with HIV. And that t-shirt was so popular that over the years, dozens and dozens of them were produced for each occasion. Here we see Mandela's visit to Kailicha and him hugging Zaki Ahmad, trying to convince Zaki to take ARVs. And Zaki saying, I will only take ARVs if they become available in public health services. So tech was launched. December, on the 10th December 1998, which is the International Human Rights Day. And as I said in Durban, it was launched around the funeral of Ugud Lamini. In Johannesburg, Simon Corley, who was a gay activist and also an anti-apartheid activist who was part of the Delmas treason trial. Um, he passed away on the 1st of December, 22 years ago, due to HIV-related illnesses. And at his memorial, Zaki pointed out that Simon had passed away because he was poor, because he was black, because he lived in Africa. That year, <clears throat> at the International AIDS Conference in Geneva, the big slogan was make ARVs accessible to people. But it was mainly centered around USA, Europe, and the global north. And at this funeral, Zaki committed to start a movement that will bring ARV access to Africa and the global south. In Cape Town, we didn't have a funeral. So we sat on the steps of St. Mary's Cathedral and started the prevention of mother to child campaign, um, asking government to provide antiretrovirals to pregnant mothers which they refused until taken to court, went to high court, and finally in 2002, the Constitutional Court ruled in favor of the treatment action campaign, compelling government to provide PMTCT. Nineteen ninety nine was basically spent building branches throughout South Africa, developing treatment literacy, a huge part of the work of Treatment Action Campaign was to educate people around opportunistic infections, the treatments that were needed to treat them, 
and about patent laws and what made this expensive medicine so expensive and out of reach of people. Um, and we campaigned around GlaxoSmithKline dropping the price of AZT and similar other struggles. 2000, a huge thing happened that MSF, um, also known as Doctors Without Borders, came to South Africa, was refused entry to Gauteng and Durban, where they wanted to operate, and then were given permission in Cape Town to start a clinic in Kayelicha, um, where I started working in 2000. And the alliance between Treatment Action Campaign and MSF lasted um, until now. A huge event was in July, in Durban of that year, the International AIDS Conference came to South Africa, to Africa for the first time. And we obviously mobilized for it for a huge march of more than 5,000 people marching to the stadium where the opening of the conference happened and asking for ARVs for Africa. We also at that conference started the campaign for fluconazole, which is an antifungal medicine, which was sold in South Africa by a company called Pfizer for more than 100 rand a tablet. Whereas when we flew to Thailand through our connections with MSF, we could buy them from the government pharmaceutical producers for uh, one rand 80 per tablet. And they apologized to us for making 300% profit. It only cost them 60 cents to produce the medicine that Pfizer sold for more than 100 rand. And this made it very practical how the profiteering of the big pharmaceutical companies worked around ARVs as well. And we managed to get COSATU support because of this practical campaign that we led for fluconazole. <laughs> the alliance with Doctors Without Borders was very important because they take all our campaigns international. It nearly felt like being part of another international political organization. And MSF made many posters around access to treatment. On your left, that's not a springbok. It's actually a ticket that you get, like if you go to home affairs and they tell you you're number 200 in the queue. So this is a ticket that says that you are 40 million in the queue lining up for your ARV. Because many people died not having access to their drugs. And I'm just sharing some of the posters of MSF, kind of amplifying the campaigns that we were running in South Africa and making sure that the whole world, all the countries where they are active, know about our campaigns and our struggle for life-saving medication. Our campaign had to take, or oh, on first we took sides with government against pharmaceutical companies. There were 40 companies that wanted to block generic medication in South Africa. And we joined the court case and this made the pharmaceutical companies to withdraw um, in 2002. We also imported illegally generic ARVs from Brazil with support of treatment action campaign, MSF and COSATU. And in Brazil, we could get fixed dose combination. So they combine different ARVs in the same medicine. And we said that should be a prerequisite for an ARV program to make adherence much simpler. In 2003, we took the companies GlaxoSmithKline and Beringer to court to ask for them to do away with their patent right that they maintained. They had 20 years right to produce the medicine on their own, charging any price, and only after that allowing generic generic manufacturing. The South African Competition Commission said they don't have a right to that patent. They are abusing it. And that year, an Indian company was allowed to produce generic ARVs as a fixed dose combination and sold them for 1% of the price that was charged by the big pharmaceutical companies. So yearly treatment went from 10,000 US dollar per year to 100 US dollar 
per year. That's about 100 rands per month. So that was the first mountain overcome, the costing and the high cost of ARVs. The second mountain that we had to overcome was the reluctance of our government and the complacency and actually the antagonism against ARVs. And for two years, we had a defiance campaign of civil disobedience asking for money to be arrested. And finally, in 2007, at the end of the year, a comprehensive ARV plan was approved, which started the rollout of ARVs to South Africa. A lot of this was possible because of the leadership of Eric Kumar, do you see this picture? who was the leader of MSF in South Africa. Uh, previously, I've shown the pictures of Zaki Ahmad, the leader of PAC. And I chose this picture because it shows how many posters we had. Ahmad, you must try and get some of these posters into your library. They all show people that I treated in Kailicha and their experiences around ARVs, um, educating other people what they should consider when starting ARVs. While I'm in Kailicha, I just want to talk a little about, about lab, because we were very aware that it wasn't just the cost of ARVs that was prohibitive, but also the high cost of monitoring with CD4s and viral loads. And Debbie Glencross and Wendy Stevens, that some of you will know, came to Kailicha to our office and we discussed how to make lab testing cheaper and I'm not quite sure if Debbie had already developed the pan leucogating method or was in the process of developing it, but we talked about making sure that it doesn't get a profitable enterprise. It was very interesting for me, 10 years later, I worked in Swaziland. And the labs were using bead assays, which were more expensive and which put a huge pressure on the program because for that we required fresh blood samples. And that basically prohibited us from giving ARVs at clinics because there was no transport system between clinics and the central lab. And I went to the lab to discuss with them, why don't they use pain leucogating because then the blood samples can be older and we can at least organize the transport once a week. The lab staff laughed at me and say they all know the PLG method. All of them trained in South Africa. They've all used PLG method, but they wanted to stick to the bead essays. And I could never figure out, but I thought that the company um, Beck and Coulter had something to do with it. This is the third mountain we had uh, to overcome. But I think before I talk us through that, I thought perhaps we can have a short discussion on what I've discussed already. Sorry, um, so Herman, um, yeah, any, any, any comments or questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat group. Um, I'll try and also look for hands. Mm, I just think it gets, tiring just listening to me and many people had many experiences and I think it's important to hear how other people experienced these moments in our struggle for ARVs and for cheaper lab technology. Hi, um, sorry I can't raise my hand. Um, it's Lynn here. Hi Herman. Thanks for... Um, Hi Lynn. I am old enough to remember this <laughs> um, and it's really um, yeah it's fascinating to be revisiting this particularly at this time you know with uh, with COVID and realizing how important political leadership is when dealing with um, you know infectious diseases um, and I think um, you know during the uh, one of the big issues that we had to deal with was just you know the link between HIV and AIDS, you know, we had to sit on panels 
uh, you know, to provide, you know, evidence of, of something that was obvious to everybody, you know, so it was this kind of, you know, crazy scenario. And it's a bit like what, you know, is happening in America right now. And, uh, and again, you know, you can see when there's no leadership, um, you know, what's happening in the US in terms of COVID, um, you know, both in terms of the, the infection rates and the death rates. And I think um, certainly having lived through HIV and now living through COVID, I'm very um, grateful that our present uh, government has shown very strong leadership actually over, over COVID. And we haven't got everything right, but for the most part, you know, I think uh, we've come through it pretty well. So, uh, so thanks for bringing this up. I think it's really quite fascinating, uh, you know, to, uh, to be discussing this right now. Thanks. Can I also say something? I, I don't know how to raise my hand. I am actually touched because I was working in 1997, I was working in the hospice. And as, and, and as we're talking how the, the tech fought for the treatment, I was just reminded of how people struggled to get the fluconazole, how many people struggled with the crypto, cryptococcal meningitis because it was difficult to get it. I remember we even used, we used, we, we used to give them uh, the pessaries for the, for the thrush in the mouth. So I'm really very touched that there's people who really sacrifice their lives to see that people got what they needed. And, and for me, I've, um, I've seen the bad side of the HIV in 1997 where people were really dying. And I've also seen the good of the ARVs because I worked in the mines 2004, 2005. And we started these ARVs and the doctors used to say, we've got nothing to lose, let's start them. And we saw people coming who would not go underground. After six months, they would go underground. So I really want to say, guys, thank you <laughs> what you have done, the sacrifice that you have made. I'm so excited today. You know, on the mines going underground means that they will go back to work. For other people going underground means that they've died. Oh, okay. about <laughs> that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anybody else who wants to share something or comment on some of the experiences of those days? This is Gail Sherman speaking. Um, in those days, adults weren't treated and children were completely overlooked. In 2004, when the rollout of the guidelines um, for universal access um, to, to ARVs or public health access rather, um, were written, there was still no diagnostic test um, to diagnose HIV in children we used to uh, see huge numbers of children at HIV clinics, most of whom were not infected, completely healthy, um, because they were exposed but not infected, but we had no test to find the infected kids except those that were incredibly ill. And then, as with the adults, we couldn't do anything about it um, because we couldn't treat them. So from a time when 25 to 30% of children born to infected women uh, became uh, infected themselves and usually didn't make their second birthday as that one poster showed, uh, we are now down to less than 5% of uh, children being infected, but that's still too many children. Thanks. Perhaps I should carry on. Or is there somebody else who wants to add something now? I, I think you can carry on, Haman. Nothing in the chat group. Okay. Um, 
So in other countries, people talked about HIV AIDS. I usually talked about HIV TB um, because the first life-threatening illness that most of our service users had was TB. And for a long time, government prevented us in a way from testing them because they tried to enforce WHO protocols, which just said we should only treat people that were smear positive. And we could see people were dying of TB, not being allowed to test, uh, test them with any other test except microscopy, a test that was developed by, or was used by Koch, Robert Koch, um, to diagnose TB more than 100 years earlier. And we were forced to use that same technology still. Um, obviously, we defied it and asked for TB cultures, which was more expensive and took a month to come back. But it often helped us to confirm the people that we had already put empirically onto treatment. And there was a huge campaign necessary to convince our superiors and government to allow us to test uh, treat TB empirically. Because in people with HIV, because the immunity is weaker, they don't have cavities in the lungs, that they don't cough up the sputum with bacilli in it. And in many cases, they've got extra pulmonary TB. So basically, we didn't have a diagnostic test for them. Um, many also had MDR TB, which was basically out of reach in Lusiki City to put people onto treatment for MDR TB. So basically, we struggled with those two components of TB care. On this picture, you see my wife um, who went to the USA with MSF and talked at WHO conferences and to the Bill and, uh, yeah, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation asking them to support more finding of TB diagnostics. Um, what basically brought about the change in thinking of the World Health Organization was the outbreak of XDR TB in Church of Scotland Hospital in Tugela Ferry, where 53 people were found to have XDR TB. That is at the time when the information was presented at an international AIDS conference. And <laughs> It made the biggest headlines of the International AIDS Conference, and there were seven emergency meetings called by WHO on TB in the uh, coming year after that, um, which helped us a lot to further the point that we were trying to say that we need better TB diagnostics. I moved then with Marta to Ethiopia, her mother country, and was responsible for TB HIV integration in the country, uh, in several districts of the country. And from MSF, I had experienced, not practically, but hearing about a thin layer agar culture medium that people used in Eastern Europe, which could diagnose TB within four or five days. And because it was so cheap, you could immediately set up, when you set up the TB culture, set it up with four different windows, checking for resistance to medicines. And I really thought that this was the way to go in Ethiopia, where each clinic, wherever in Ethiopia, hundreds and hundreds of rural clinics, each of them has got a microscopist who did TB smears, who did malaria testing, and who would have been able to set up some agar plates. Um, Yet the American organization with which I worked had more information about microscopic observed direct susceptibility, um, which basically uses a liquid medium and then looks with an inverted microscope from the bottom to see at the fern leaf spreading of the TB cultures. And that also within a week could diagnose TB and MDR TB. And we were actually Ethiopia, Addis Ababa was one of the sites where this method was tested in the laboratory. And the staff in Addis Ababa knew very well about this method. And we were probably having six to nine months of discussions about how to implement this. And then a single visit 
by a director of Beckman Dickinson changed the government to go for the automated midget liquid culture method, which was for me a huge disappointment because it's centralized. It means sputums had to be shipped from all over Ethiopia to a central laboratory in Addis Ababa, which was impossible. This basically prohibited anybody in Ethiopia outside Addis to be tested for MDR-TB. Um, more or less at the same time, the line trope assay was developed, uh, molecular technology, and we thought that that might have more promise in the long term than liquid cultures, and set up the first line probe assay in Ethiopia. <laughs> From Ethiopia, I moved to Swaziland. And the same debate happened again. Um, But by that time, Gene Expert, which was developed kind of as a technology, as a spin off of the 9 11 and of the attacks on the World uh, Trade Centers. After that, there was scare of anthrax being sent around to key politicians. And the security services in the USA asked companies to develop a molecular test, a PCR test for anthrax that could be done by post office workers in the post office. And based on that, the gene expert uh, equipment was produced. When we heard about this, we said, well, we need this for TB. And um, our connections to the Melinda Gates Foundation kind of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think helped towards financing the development of gene expert MTB RIF. But when I came to South Africa and tried to introduce it in Ishawi where it was working then, um, it worked very well and I was surprised that I could learn within five minutes how to test people for MDR-TB and come with a very reliable result. But it saddens me that this test is still limited to labs and not available at clinic level. Because majority of people need TB testing at clinics. And a lot of TB diagnosis is missed because we see people at clinics, we see the TB symptoms, but we have to send away a sputum, ask the person to come back a week later. And a week later, either the result doesn't meet the person or the person doesn't come back or the person has gone to the emergency center at the hospital in the meantime and sputum samples are repeated. And we see a lot of people that have positive samples at a laboratory, but are not on treatment because of this. And I really think if we could bring gene expert down to clinic level, we would solve a lot of our TB problems in this country. And <clears throat> I think it came clear also with COVID, where we could have used, if we had a good infrastructure of gene experts at clinic level, I think we could have, I know there was a problem of cartridges not getting into the country, and I would like to learn more about that, what was the prohibiting factors, and what are now the challenges of getting gene expert COVIDs. Um, but yeah, I really think that we need to look at decentralizing some of our lab equipment as we get more point of care testing that we don't just limit it to hospital based labs. I mean, Gene Expert was developed for post office workers. So surely we can find somebody at a clinic to process the tests. Um, TV treatment was a big problem. Mm -hmm. And I was glad when streptomycin was cut from the second regimen. And in 2016, WHO approved a shorter MDR-TB course. And in 2018, approved the injection-free treatment course, including two new TB medicines, pedaculin and delaminate. 
And I really think we've made huge progress with TB since, you know, the interaction between HIV clinicians and TB um, and the activism drove the agenda a bit faster than it used to develop before that. This shows how Doctors Without Borders has kind of used the activism of South Africa then for other diseases like Hep C, which had 70 million people not on treatment. With the treatment being developed, costing 750 per pill or making a regimen about $150,000 and thereby putting it out of access. They repeated their posters that they knew from the HIV epidemic, uh, showing how ridiculously expensive medicines are, costing more than diamonds or gold per gram. And all this lobbying resulted in the price coming down to 120 US dollar, making it now accessible to many, many, many more people. <coughs> um, last thought on COVID. I don't like this post of MSF. <coughs> it talks about a key problem, um, people dropping out of treatment for AIT and TB due to COVID getting priority. But it kind of tells patients what to do. And I think the problem is that our health services uh, restructured and put a lot of difficulties onto service users. And I think we should have addressed how we as health services respond better to keeping people on treatment. Um, <clears throat> I'll finish off here. This link on the side of the slide is a link to an MSF film showing kind of making a call that none of the COVID testing or none of the COVID medicines, COVID immunizations, vaccines should be patented and that they should immediately become available to all citizens of this planet. My last slide shows three paintings of a book that was published of people that I treated in Saitsi Kailicha telling their stories of living with HIV. And these murals can now be seen at the Constitutional Court in Johannesburg. And I think an electronic um, exhibition of them would also be good for the museum. I especially like the CD4 cells on these pictures, all these white blood cells streaming through people's bodies. Um, thank you very much. And thank I thought that we can have more discussion about COVID and the lessons of what we learned from HIV for COVID. Thank you, uh, Herman. Thank you very, very much for your, your insights and taking us uh, on, on that journey. Um, I'm trying to have a look on the, the chat group. Are there any questions uh, if you want to put in the chat? So otherwise, uh, uh, you're welcome to, to raise your hand. And if you can't raise your hand, please uh, just um, unmute yourself and, uh, and ask. Hi, Herman, it's Lynn again. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you can comment on um, South Africa's response to um, COVAX and you know, trying to access vaccines for, for coronavirus. And if you feel that's an area that we really should be more uh, kind of have more activism. I know too little to comment on it, but I think you know, involving communities um, and not just doing activism as healthcare workers, but involving communities around it would be very important. Yeah, because I think one of the, you know, one of the, it's not only just an access, well, it's a manufacturing and access issue, but it's also about um, people being willing to take vaccines as well. So I guess there's lots of areas that we, you know, we will need to, uh, um, I guess, work on and, 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 you know, to make sure that vaccines are deployed here so that we don't keep having repeat cycles of, uh, you know, COVID um, uh, infections. I mean, I think a huge issue is about production. How can we scale up production so that we don't have to be too selective about who gets? And then we look at target groups who should receive vaccines first. And I think most people say healthcare workers should get it first. 
But I think it, if we have these discussions in public fora, it would help all people to see the relevance and the importance of getting the vaccine. And, you know, people wouldn't see it as a threat to get vaccines, but would see it as, as you know, it's a right that we must campaign for, that there should be access of vaccines for all. Thank you. Yeah. Lots of work still to do. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a question from, from Dr. Tendersai Chakeza. She says, uh, how is the work of uh, TAC changed with test and treat? Uh, where is the next frontier? And what about prevention? Um, first of all, when I left South Africa to go to Ethiopia and Swaziland, I basically left contact with the treatment action campaign. So I'm not able to speak on behalf of TAC at the moment. I think that test and treat, um, I don't know if you can see the back of my t-shirt. It's basically a call for test and treat, um, which MSF became involved in 2010, 2011 and opened a site in Ishawi to model it. And I think that's so far the most effective prevention program we've had in this country, both for TB and for HIV. So I really think all resources should be put into test and treat and ensuring <coughs> that we don't neglect the treatment literacy that should go along with it. And I think often we're neglecting the treatment literacy um, to strengthen service users in understanding the need for adherence. Sorry, and uh, the next frontier, Herman? In terms of HIV? In terms of HIV. Perfect. I mean, obviously, COVID is a frontier. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Involving more service users. I think that should always be the bottom line. Not telling communities what to do, but asking communities how we can work together overcoming health problems. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. If there's... Um... No further questions. I uh, think I'm going to wrap up. Ah, we have we have a uh, a question here. Um, okay, so uh, this is with reference to uh, a case of uh, TB meningitis uh, uh, secondary to. Uh, defaulting or not being able to access antiretroviral therapy. No one knows why this patient uh, uh, did not have a full bottle of ARVs. Um, do we have some idea uh, how much devastation this period has had uh, on mortality rates based on defaulting or, or perhaps uh, not accessing antiretroviral therapy? Mm. I think I mean, there's been reports of tens of thousands of people interrupting treatment because of COVID. Um, I think if you're using robust antiretrovirals, that the long-term effect will hopefully not to be too dire. Um, but I think short-term, a lot of people um, will suffer also with other illnesses um, that are being pushed to the periphery of you know, our health system. And yes, I think that's one of the, you know, as I was saying initially, uh, head on dealing with COVID leads to many side effects and collateral damage like the economy, like other health issues. And I think we need to struggle to maintain a balance. I mean, we've still got more people dying of TB and HIV than of COVID. We've got still more people dying to smoke-related illnesses than of COVID. And these are young deaths, whereas the COVID deaths are largely in older people. So I think we need to balance very carefully and not, you know, get, get completely absorbed in the struggle for COVID. I know COVID is a short well, if you manage it well, we think it might be short term, 
um, and we want to flatten the curve. But yeah, I think we've got other responsibilities as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, um, Herman. I uh, wish you all the best, especially with your, your latest endeavors with um, drug and alcohol uh, uh, dependent patients. And uh, hopefully you can do the same for them as, as you did early on uh, with the uh, antiretroviral treatment. And thank you all for uh, attending uh, our World AIDS Day uh, event at NICD. And I wish you a, a pleasant day further. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thanks, Herman. That was brilliant. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.